Let's pray together. Lord God, you are our salvation. You alone are our salvation, for vain is the help of man. God, we are weak. God, you are strong. Like Joshua's trumpets at Jericho, like Gideon's lanterns at Midian, like David's little smooth stones in the valley of Elah, in our weakness, we ask you to display your almighty power. God, though we are weak, you are almighty and strong. So now in this moment, we look to you. We are powerless. You are all powerful. Now we would attempt great things in the conscious awareness of our inability to do anything without the abiding presence of Jesus Christ, our only Lord and Savior. And so we depend upon you. Amen. Amen. What do I do when I feel like God has forgotten me? Here's how it works. God promises us everything. He promises us heaven. But before we get to heaven, there are many dangers, toils, and snares along the way. And we know God's good, and we know that he's promised us good and great things, but we know that life is really hard. So here's the Bible, and we believe that it's true, but here's our unbelieving, doubting, fearful hearts. We kind of say, God, I believe, but help my unbelief. Here's the truth of God and all of his promises, and here's the doubts and the fears and the excuses and the sort of whining from the hearts of men and women. The Lord makes and repeats precious promises of salvation. And God's people, we spiral between belief and unbelief, between doubt and despair. God calls us to have our minds transformed by his word. And yet, week by week, our minds continue to be conformed to the world around us and the unbelief within us. And it's not strange to have a conversation with a sweet church friend who says, I feel like God has forgotten me. This is what Isaiah 49 is about. The servant of the Lord the pro prophecy about the Son of God, the servant of the Lord, the Messiah, Jesus Christ, that began in Isaiah 42. The servant of the Lord is going to reappear here in Isaiah 49. And in the first half of Isaiah 49 are some of the greatest promises of what the servant of the Lord will do. So here's the good promise of what God will provide. And yet right alongside that, we have God's people not really believing that promise and instead whining about what God hasn't done yet. You can see it really clearly in verse, if you're in Isaiah 49, you can see it really clearly in the Grand Canyon between verse 13 and verse 14. Verses 1 through 13 are all these wonderful promises of what God's going to do and how he's going to have his people's back and he's going to take care of them. And you can see how it crescendos in verse 13. Sing for joy, O heavens. Exult, O earth. Break forth, O mountains, into singing. The Lord has comforted his people. He'll have compassion on his afflicted. And then, look at verse 14. <laughs> but Zion said, the Lord has forsaken me. My Lord has forgotten me. God's people doubting, disbelieving, spiraling downward into despondency. And church, I want to help you who even 
this very hour barely made it here because you're not sure and you're struggling and you're hurting. I believe the best way to help, I know that the best way to help you is not with some new modern idea, but even with this ancient, bulletproof, everlasting prophecy of Isaiah. And so I want to walk through this text verse by verse and show you how it helps us in our variegated crises that we go through day by day. Isaiah 49, we'll just read it and comment on it along the way. Verse 1, listen to me, O coastlands, and give attention, you peoples from afar. The Lord called me from the womb, and from the body of my mother, he named my name. This is a servant song. This is a prophecy about Jesus Christ. Isaiah 49, verse 1, along with Isaiah 7, 14, I bet you got a Christmas card with Isaiah 7, 14 on it. Isaiah 49, 1, along with Isaiah 7, 14, are two of the clearest Old Testament prophecies that the Messiah will be born of a woman. That's the servant of the Lord, Jesus And look at what it says about Jesus, verse 2. He made my mouth like a sharp sword. In the shadow of his hand, he hid me. He made me a polished arrow. In his quiver, he hid me away. And he said to me, you are my servant, Israel, in whom I will be glorified. But I said, I've labored in vain. I've spent my strength for nothing in vanity. Yet surely my right is with the Lord and my recompense with my God. And now the Lord says, he who formed me from the womb to be his servant, to bring Jacob back to him, and that Israel might be gathered to him, for I am honored in the eyes of the Lord, and my God has become my strength. You see here in verses 2 through 5 that the servant has a sorrowful ministry, and yet he is still strengthened by God. This holds true of Jesus, but I want to point out that the servant is named actually Israel in verse 3. What's that about? You are my servant, Israel, in whom I'll be glorified. So we got to interpret this. At first sight, it might seem like God's no longer talking to the servant of the Lord. Now he's just talking to Israel. But then it says in verses 4 and 5 that the purpose of the servant is to regather Israel to the Lord. So something more prophetic and bigger has to be happening because how could Israel save Israel? How could Israel regather Israel? Apparently what's happening here is, I think the best way to interpret it is, Israel missed it so far that she needed a substitute, a new Israel, a stand-in to take her place. And this is one more place where every little stream and tributary and river flows into the great fulfillment, which is Jesus Christ. Jesus is the true and last Adam, standing where Adam fell. Jesus Christ is the true and last high priest, fulfilling all that the sacrifices foretold. Jesus is the true and final Lamb of God. The marriage that Jesus has with his church is the actual marriage that every human marriage is meant to reflect. And here, this text says that Jesus is the true and final Israel, the called of God, in whose seed all the nations of the earth will be blessed. Don't you think it must be a prophecy of the Garden of Gethsemane and of the suffering when he speaks of spending his strength? Verse 4, for nothing. Don't you think that may refer to how the disciples felt on that day when the sun darkened in the sky and Jesus died? Verse 4 is the suffering how few responded to him, and how the powers of the earth, quote-unquote, successfully silenced him when they arrested him and murdered him. But then in verse 5, this reassurance that this is the purpose for which the Lord sent him, 
And the Lord God became his strength even in the might of his resurrection. So the Messiah surprisingly conquers by dying and rising again. This is showing us that the gospel is an improbable plan that wasn't hatched by the will of man or the, or the committee coming up with the best way to do things. It's God's surprising way to save the world. I think we quit reading in verse 5, pick up verse 6 and 7. He says, It is too light a thing that you should be my servant to raise up the tribes of Jacob and to bring back the preserved of Israel. I'm going to make you a light for the nations that my salvation may reach to the end of the earth. Thus says the Lord, the Redeemer of Israel and His Holy One. To one deeply despised, abhorred by the nation, the servant of rulers, kings shall see and arise, princes, and they shall prostrate themselves because of the Lord who is faithful, the Holy One of Israel, who has chosen you. I love how he says in verse 6, I'm going to save Israel, but saving Israel is too small. In In a little microcosm of it is the chance I have to talk to a new believer who just came to Christ and now he's joining the church and he says to me this is this is so great that I'm a Christian now and I get to go to heaven and I say to him it is so great but it's too small if all you think about is the fact that now you're a Christian and you get to go to heaven isn't it the case that you work at such and such place with 800 other people don't you think God's purpose goes beyond you to continue to share this light. In verse 6, verse 6 of Isaiah 49 is quoted in Acts chapter 13, verse 47, when the apostle Paul completes his ministry, his missionary ministry to the Gentiles. This is a verse that they quote, that this is being fulfilled. We, We talked about this concept in our ABFs in 2 Corinthians 8 and 9 where these churches from these other places are collecting money so these other churches far away can be cared for. This is how it continues. This is why we prayed for Doug and Amy Nunziato today in our services. This is why we're praying, actually, one of my prayers for that that list of 200 or 250 names of who's up at Fort Wilderness. One of the things I prayed was that some of those young people would be saved. Beyond that, I'm praying that some of those young people would be sponsored by this church to go into full-time missions in the future. This is what it's all about. And it's all here in Isaiah 49. We'll pick it up in verse 8. Thus says the Lord, in a time of favor I have answered you. In a day of salvation I've helped you. I will keep you and give you as a covenant to the people to establish the land, to apportion the desolate heritages. Saying to the prisoners, come out. To those who are in darkness, appear. And they shall feed along the ways, on all bare heights shall be their pasture. They shall not hunger or thirst, neither scorching wind nor sun shall strike them. For he who has pity on them will lead them, and by springs of water will guide them, and will make my mountains a road, and my highways shall be raised up. Verses 8 through 10 is, uh, I read this as the ideal conditions that God will provide for his people in the millennium to come. There's a pre-fillment here where Isaiah is speaking of those in the Babylonian captivity who will come back and God will protect them. But there's a final fulfillment at the second coming of the Lord Jesus Christ. And then we'll read from verse 11 down to verse 13 and that big hinge is between verse 13 and 14. So he's going to make the mountains a road and the highways raised up. Verse 12, Behold, these shall come from afar and behold those from the north and the west, from the land... Sing for joy, O heavens, and exult, O earth. Break forth, O mountains, into singing, for the Lord has comforted his people and will have compassion on his afflicted. So it says in verse 13 that we're supposed to sing. Singing in Isaiah is always a praise and victory song, but singing in Isaiah is never about the praise of the the arms or the strength of a man or a woman who provided the victory. Singing in Isaiah is always a praise for God and God alone who provided the victory. This is the wonderful news of God's salvation. 
There was a sweet little song in Isaiah 12. Listen to Isaiah 12, verses 1 and 2. You will say on that day, I give thanks to you, O Lord, for though you were angry with me, your anger turned away that you might comfort me. Behold, God is my salvation. I will trust and will not be afraid, for the Lord God is my strength and my song. The Lord is my salvation. Isaiah 12, verses 1 and 2. In Isaiah 49, verse 13, did you see who is singing? Who is singing here in verse 13? Now this morning, you all sang. But you may have noticed, we only gave microphones to people with a good voice. We, everyone's voice is supposed to be lifted up, but there's like requirements for getting up here and having a microphone. Different people can sing at different levels and different pitches and different notes. Who's singing in verse 13? Sing for joy, O heavens, and exult, O earth. Worldwide redemption calls for cosmic celebratory singing. Romans 8 says that the creation, the creation was subjected to futility because of Adam's sin and a holy God's curse upon Adam and the planet over which Adam had dominion. And it says in Romans 8, 19, 20, 21 that all of creation is yearning, groaning for that day when the futility will be no more and the rocks and the hills and the trees and the heavens will cry out with praises to God. This is the high point in verse 13. And now look at the low point in verse 14. But Zion said, the Lord has forsaken me. My Lord has forgotten me. This grinding of gears between verses 13 and 14 couldn't be stronger. Such a difference. I mean, the difference between verses 13 and 14, believe it or not, is a bigger difference between the price of a dozen eggs six months ago and the price of a dozen eggs today. Am I right? Can I get a witness? <laughs> I thought, I saw that news story, I saw another news story that kind of made me sad, the difference, uh, the difference between uh, Queen Elizabeth and, Her and Harry and Meghan. The selflessness, the nobility, the honor, the tradition, and the Hollywood self-absorption. Things, things change, you know, over the years. Huge difference. But the huge difference in 13 and 14 is that God's promising this salvation. And Zion says, the Lord has forsaken me, my Lord has forgotten me. All the world may be singing. But God's people are grumpy. All the world may be rejoicing. But God's people are like, I, I would have joy if God came through, but God's not doing anything, so I'm grouchy. Here's where the Bible promises they seem to have a hard time capturing the uh, tenor of our inner life. The message of God's grand plan for history and the return of Jesus. But then we get bad news on a Tuesday afternoon and we miss out on perspective, right? Perspective. The difference of perspective is that I think we've, I think we've talked about this church over the years. The difference of perspective is that if I begin to look at my circumstances real hard and then I see God only through my circumstances, this leads to fear and faithlessness. But the perspective is, if I look at God and I really take in his word and then I see my circumstances through God and his word, this leads from fear to faith. This leads from despair to hope. That's the difference. And just like us, the people of Israel could, could 
hear God's promises, but then just get turned around on that little seesaw of seeing things in the wrong perspective. One side goes up and the other side goes down. We get overwhelmed by the troubles around us and then we forget God who is above us. But if we can really see God and really hear his word, then things fall into place. That's the seesaw, right? When we doubt God's word, we begin to believe that today is going to last forever. When we don't trust God, we begin to multiply our fears. In the human heart, trust never disappears. Oh, it's true that you can stop trusting God, but don't you think it's never the case that you're utterly without trust in anything? You're always trusting in something. But when we refuse to trust God, then we just trust the, the world's lies or just our own emotional opinion about what's happening. And this is the, the wrong way to go. Look at how God answers in verses 15 and 16. This is God's answer. Can a woman forget her nursing child that she should have no compassion on the son of her womb? Even these may forget, yet I will not forget you. Behold, I have engraved you on the palms of my hands. Your walls are continually before me. This is God's answer, and what an answer it is. He says, do you think I have forgotten you? Do you think I have let you go? Troubled saints, forgetful saints, fearful saints, in this room, hear the word of the Lord now. Despair and despondency, doubting God, is groundless for this reason. God is, and God loves, and God never forgets. He says, can a mom forget her little nursing child? And then he says, maybe in some extreme case that could happen, yet it will never happen with me. And then he says in verse 16, uh, could I forget you? If I was forgetful, maybe I'd have to write a post-it note somewhere and put it up. More than that, he carved it into his very skin. But he's saying, I could never forget you because such is his love. Then in uh, verses 17 to 26, if you'd permit me to just summarize those without reading every one of them, the thing to notice about verses 17 to 26 is that the, the language in verses 17 to 26 is all borrowed in the New Testament in Revelation chapter 16. In Revelation chapter 16. And what, that's the, the conclusion of the bold judgments. And so this is again a prophecy where uh, in the end, uh, God will fulfill all of this when he returns to judge the nations and to establish his kingdom over all things. Ro Romans 11 refers to this. I see this, some of the fulfillment of this in Revelation 20 in the millennial reign. Where the oppressors of his people are in turn judged. You see that all over here in verses 17 to 26. And as we summarize that, I wanted to read chapter 50, verses 1 through 3, because the unit here, I think, goes through verse 3 of chapter 50. I think it's a relatively poor uh, chapter break in the text. So 50, 1 through 3, is another reason why God's not going to forget them. So he said, can a mom forget her nursing child? No. Can, I've carved you in my hands. And then he tells how he's going to judge their enemies. And then listen to chapter 50, verses 1 through 3. Thus says the Lord, where is your mother's certificate of divorce with which I sent her away? Or which of my creditors is it to whom I've sold you? Behold, for your iniquities you were sold, and for your transgressions your mother was sent away. Why, when I came, was there no man? Why, when I called, was there no one to answer? Is my hand shortened that it cannot redeem? Or have I no power to deliver? Behold, by my, by my rebuke, I dry up the sea. I make the rivers a desert. 
Their fish stink for a lack of water and die of thirst. I clothe the heavens with blackness and make sackcloth their covering. Chapter 50, verses 1 through 3, is the continuation of verses 14 and 15, of verses 15 and 16 of chapter 49. There, he said, can I forget you? A mom's not going to forget her kid. Here, he says, have I divorced you? Israel sinned and deserved judgment. And they received the judgment of the Babylonian captivity. But God never divorced them. God never disowned them. They claim in verse 1 of chapter 50 that God divorced them. In Deuteronomy 24, it talks about a certificate of divorce. And so God calls their bluff and he says, if I did, show me the certificate. It's not there. No such certificate exists. And then the second illustration, not only did he not divorce them, he didn't sell them to his creditors. So the idea there where he says, have I, have I sold you to my creditors? Like, like a bad investment, you just offload it and, and, and sell it away real quick. And God says, well, think that through. Uh, who's going to buy something from me? Who am I going to owe something to? You're not some property that's been sold off because you're no good to me anymore. And so these are two more proofs that God is and that God keeps his promises. That God is, that God is love, that God makes promises, and that God keeps his promises. And then he asks the question, is my hand shortened that it can't save? And in such a tactile, unforgettable way, he says, if you were there, you would remember how the fish started to smell when I delivered you from Egypt. My arm's not too short. My hand's not too short. So church, as we pull this together, when I feel like God has forgotten me, what do I do? How can my heart be helped when my heart is despondent? What do I do when I feel like God has forgotten me? And I want to show you how this ancient prophecy can help your heart today. You may feel like God has forgotten you. The way you feel is the way you feel. You may feel like God has forgotten you. You may feel like God is far away and he's not keeping good to his promises. But one thing to recognize is that your feelings don't represent reality. They really are your feelings, but they aren't necessarily reality. And your feelings don't represent the truth about God. They may truly represent the way you feel about God, but they don't truly represent who God is. It's God's revelation that truly represents who he is. What do you do when you feel like God has forgotten you? Or maybe your question to me is, well, uh, my faith is relatively strong, Spencer, but I have a friend who keeps telling me that she thinks God's forgotten her. How can I help her? I want to show you how to do that. Let's say... I don't know, I had eight of them. I think I, if I can read my writing here, I think I put them down to, to three. First, stop looking down and start looking up. And what I mean by that is that seesaw of seeing circumstances or seeing God. Stop looking down and start looking up. When we see the events of today, you know, then, then, then we try to look at God through those events. It's, it's very warped. But when we see God, then we, then we can properly see the things around us. So start with God and then look down at the circumstances around you. Don't start with the circumstances around you and then try to see God. And the thing about, the reason that we call doubt sometimes a spiral is that doubt and unbelief always expends more mental energy on doubt and unbelief than on the character of God. And healthy faith spends its mental energy on, on praising God, on trusting God, on hearing from God. So stop looking down and start looking up. Stop looking around at shifting circumstances and start looking up at the unchanging character of Almighty God. Look at his promises. Answer his question. 
in chapter 50, verse 2. Is my hand shortened that it cannot redeem? Have I no power to deliver? He does. And he is. Hear his, hear his assurances in verses 15 and 16 of chapter 49. Hear the earth longing for him in chapter 49, verse 13. Stop looking down and start looking up. Start, start, start looking at his promises in his word. The second, the advice would be stop trusting your feelings and start trusting God's facts. Stop trusting your feelings and start trusting God's facts. We have 66 books in this book that tell us who God is and what he has said. The other marvelously comforting thing about this book is that we have so many human feelings in here. God made us emotional beings. I'm not saying pretend you don't have feelings. Feel them, but bring them into the presence of God. The book of Job, the book of Psalms, so many books where, where human feelings are a huge part of it, but you see that the, that the reality of God radiates far above the ever-shifting feelings of the heart of man and woman. Stop trusting your feelings and start trusting God's facts. Have you ever heard this? I think it's attributed to, I think it's attributed to Martin Luther. Feelings come and feelings go. It's a wonderful little rhyme. It says, feelings come and feelings go and feelings are deceiving. My warrant is the word of God, not else is worth believing. My warrant. That's why I'm saying the, the fact the ground, the assurance is the word of God. Feelings come and feelings go and feelings are deceiving. My warrant is the word of God. Naught else is worth believing. Though all my heart should feel condemned for want of some sweet token, there is one greater than my heart whose word cannot be broken. Start trusting the word of God. And uh, the third point, I want to show you how to begin trusting the word of God. Like you picture someone saying, well, I'm struggling with doubt. And my super wise counsel to them is, quit doubting and start trusting God. Well, how? <laughs> what, what can I start to do? Stop looking down and start looking up. Stop trusting your feelings and start trusting God's facts. And specifically what to do, I'd say third and finally, uh, is simply this. Have a conversation with yourself with your Bible open. Speak Scripture to your soul. Have a conversation with yourself with your Bible open and speak the truth of Scripture to your own soul. Have a, have a Psalms scripted conversation with yourself. This is, this, this, is the only, this is probably the most successful way that I've dealt with me in my moments of doubt and unbelief, is I have a Psalms scripted conversation with myself. There's a little resource that I've given out more times than I can remember. It's by Donald Whitney, who teaches down at Southern Seminary, and it's just a, a little book. It's probably only 70 or 80 pages, and it's called Praying the Bible. And that little book just shows you how to open up the Psalms and turn them into a personal conversation that you could have with yourself. Donna Whitney, praying the Bible. What I mean is just have this, have this, have this conversation where the Psalms begin to show you what's, what's what. This is, how, this is how to begin moving from doubt to faith. This is how to begin moving from despondency to hope is that you lay open your desires, your opinions, your irritabilities, your anxieties, your fears, that's what the Psalms do. They don't deny them. They lift them up, but they bring them into the presence of God. And it's through doing that that you can start speaking to yourself instead of merely listening to your own feelings. And that's why Isaiah revealed what he revealed in Isaiah 49. Because it, it is very common for us to feel like God has forgotten us. But if you are in Christ, though it can be common for you to feel like God has forgotten you, 
it is utterly impossible for God to have forgotten you. For you are in Christ. And if you are in Christ, the very blood of the Son of God has so saved you that you are now carved into the palms of his hands. He will never forget you. He will never leave you. He will never forsake you. Look to the Lord. Speak the facts of God's word to your own heart. He will keep his promises. A nursing mother won't forget her little baby. Even so, the Lord God will not forget you. He will deliver you. And keep looking to him. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, we are weak, but you are strong. Heavenly Father, even our faith, it seems like a mustard seed. So much unbelief and so much self. And yet, we ask that by your Spirit, you would continue the good work that you have begun in us. Lord, how we praise you that you don't forget. How we praise you that you make and keep your promises. And so, Spirit of God, speak to your church, minister to the weary souls and the doubting hearts, and fill us with your very presence that we might praise and glorify you. Amen.